So one of the things uh, hopefully I will try to present to you is how our approach to medical care is changing, particularly in neurology and in neurodegenerative diseases. If you look at even 10 years ago, number one, we were in the 20th century, now we are in the 21st century, so things have to change and progress. When we thought about Parkinson's disease, we looked upon it as a tremor disorder. Even today, if you ask somebody what, what comes to mind when you think of Parkinson's, the first thing people will say is tremor or shakes. And that's true, but there's a lot more to it than that. It's a complex neuropsychiatric disease. We used to look upon levodopa as the mainstay of treatment, and even today, it is by far the most effective medication in terms of Parkinson's disease treatment, but we have gone on to explore different strategies that incorporate other medications as well, particularly in early stages of the disease. Surgical treatments, when I started in my fellowship years, we were dealing with pallidotomy, thalamotomy, that involved making a lesion, essentially a small stroke in the brain, and uh, trying to control tremor in that way. The new treatment these days is deep brain stimulation, and there are many advantages to it that we will talk about a bit later. But perhaps the most important, we need to go from the sort of visit where the patient comes in, and they visit with the physician, and they're asked, Mr. Jones, how are you today? And Mr. Jones says, oh, my tremor is a bit worse. And the physician says, why don't you increase your levodopa a bit? And that's it. For these kind of diseases, we need a comprehensive approach, and that is what I am trying to build over here, and that is, I think, what, is, uh, what patients respond to and benefit from in terms of quality of life and, and care. So I wanted to start with uh, an area that might be of interest to people. What causes Parkinson's disease? And many of you must know this gentleman like me. He started out in the burbs of Chicago but his greatest success was found in South Florida, so I'm trying to follow in his footsteps here. So Muhammad Ali is um, uh, somebody that gives rise to the thought of head trauma and Parkinson's, and this is a, a very hot topic these days, not just with boxing, but also with football and, and, and even soccer. So there's a term in the literature, it's called pugilistic Parkinsonism. So pugil is the Latin root for boxer. And dementia pugilistica is a variant of what we have come to call chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It can present with memory disorders similar to Alzheimer's disease. It can present with Parkinsonian symptoms similar to Parkinson's disease. And it can uh, occur uh, decades after the boxing career has ended. Some famous boxers with uh, Parkinsonism dementia include Muhammad Ali, Jack Dempsey, and Jack Quarry. And my first uh, reference from the medical literature is going to be from the famous medical journal Sports Illustrated, which in 1983 published a wonderful paper called Too Many Punches and Too Little Concern. So even in 1983, there was an awareness that trauma can do damage to the brain. You saw pictures of uh, tr uh, head injuries or, or hemorrhages in the brain uh, as a more acute phenomenon, but even chronic injury to the brain can cause changes. One term that is used in, in the lay press is called the punch drunk syndrome. Uh, a lot of these boxers were known to be not quite right. They were punch drunk. And incidentally, uh, it, way back then, they looked at the brains with CT scan images of these boxers, eight of these champion boxers, and they found this finding. It's called uh, cavum septum pellucidum. So if you look at that blue arrow, Normally, you have the ventricles, the frontal horns, uh, just separated by a single uh, septum pellucidum. But in these boxers, there's actually a, a small gap created between the layers of the uh, septum pellucidum. And incidentally, of these boxers, Ali, of course, uh, is suffering from Parkinsonism. And Quarry died at the young age of 53 with severe dementia. So in terms of the pathology, what do you see with uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy? Cavum septum pellucidum is the most obvious in, in terms of gross pathology, but these brains show neurofibrillary tangles, similar to Alzheimer's disease. They show cerebellar atrophy. And most important in terms of Parkinsonism, there is a hypopigmentation of the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra is where you have dopamine in the brain, and hypopigmentation reflects uh, reduced dopamine in, in the brain. So in terms of the evidence, what 
do we really have that, uh, you know, the, the cause and effect is so distant that how can you really prove that uh, there is any relationship? Uh, it's, it's hard to do, but one interesting study that has looked at it, um, Goldman et al., they looked at uh, a twin registry, and they looked at 93 discordant twin pairs, and a prior history of head injury with loss of consciousness uh, had an increased risk of Parkinson's disease. The odds ratio was quite high, 3.8. However, the confidence interval is quite broad. Uh, uh, it's 1.2 to 11. So again, it's not quite conclusive. But if you look at the study even further, they looked at some more details. So if these head injured patients had a hospitalization, the, increase, uh, the odds ratio increased further. And they also looked at a subset of twins that were uh, monozygotic, and, uh, or, or concordant, rather. And they found that young onset Parkinson's disease was uh, more likely in, in these patients who had, who had had a head injury. Young onset being onset of disease uh, less than 40 years uh, of age. So clearly there's a role of trauma in causing Parkinson's disease. Now the other thing that you look at, I moved from Lincoln Park in Chicago where it's all city and ambulances and sirens going on and all of that to a place in Boynton Beach which is very quiet and all around is farmland and uh, now I'm g getting concerned should I drink the water over there and uh, this is the reason why uh, there is an animal model for Parkinson's disease we use these uh, monkeys called marmosets uh, I had occasion to uh, participate in a brain chip study at the University of Chicago where my humble role was to inject some of these folks uh, these monkeys with botulinum toxin to paralyze them so we could study what the brain chip did in their brain but this is also the same monkey is used as an animal model for Parkinson's. And what we do is we give them this compound called as MPTP. And this creates tremendous oxidative stress in the brain, destroys their mitochondrial function. And the substantia nigra is a very high metabolism area, so it is affected very readily by MPTP. And these uh, monkeys then look Parkinsonian. They start to have a tremor. They start to shuffle. They uh, have muscle rigidity. And more important, they respond to levodopa and then uh, show an improvement as well. So that's the animal model that we use. But paraquat, which is a widely used herbicide, if you look at the chemical structure of MPTP and paraquat, you don't have to be a chemist to see the similarity in, in the two structures. So it's widely used. It catalyzes the pro production of toxic oxygen radicals. So for example, hydrogen peroxide is an oxygen radical, and this can cause cell death in the brain. And uh, Tanner et al., they published a study in 2011 where they found that uh, the presence of Parkinson's disease was positively associated with pesticides that impair uh, mitochondrial function and those that increase oxidative stress. So paraquat is one of them. Now the other angle, if, uh, other than environment, whether it is toxins or injury, is genetics. So can Parkinson's be inherited is something that many patients will ask me. For a long time, we said it's not really a genetic disease. Uh, there was a study done on twins again, World War II veterans uh, who were part of a twin registry, and they looked at 268 twins, and they looked at their uh, twin bro uh, twins uh, brothers, 250 of them, and they looked at what is called as a concordance rate. So if you have PD and you uh, and the brother also has PD, that uh, is is concordance. So if you look at monozygotic twins, meaning they have identical DNA, the concordance rate was 0.15. If you look at dizygotic twins, which means not identical DNA, it was 0.11. So not much difference. So this was one of the early studies that gave rise to the idea that maybe uh, genetics is not that important. However, around that same time, there was a family being followed that uh, come from the area uh, of Italy uh, around Sicily and, uh, move, and they have family members in, uh, in the area of Rochester and uh, New York. They're called the Contursis. If you look at the literature and uh, look at Contursi kindred, you will find papers written on these folks. So about 15% of 400 of these uh, of members of this family had Parkinson's, and it ran in a straightforward autosomal dominant Mendelian inheritance. This gave rise to identification of the first gene for Parkinson's. It's called the PARC1 gene that codes for alpha-synuclein, uh, and it has provided tremendous insights, not just into the inheritance of Parkinson's, but also in terms of uh, the patho pat uh, pathology of Parkinson's disease and, and the protein structures associated with it. So PARC1 was the first gene that was isolated, 
But now we are, if I'm not mistaken, uh, at about PARC 18. So a lot of genes have been isolated. Uh, one very interesting one uh, has to do with the leucine rich repeat kinase type 2, LRRK2. And it has to do with ethnicity. So, for example, uh, certain ethnicities uh, in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, if you have Parkinson's disease, 29% of these patients will have the LRRK2 mutation. And coincidentally, if you look at North African Arabs and they have Parkinson's disease, 40% of them will have the exact same mutation. So possibly there's a founder mutation uh, in the Mediterranean area that gave rise to uh, a, a genetic basis for Parkinson's in these ethnicities. So genetics is very interesting. Having said that, if I take a look at 100 people with Parkinson's in my own practice, which is heavily biased towards Parkinson's disease, the actual uh, family in uh, basis for Parkinson's I will find in maybe 5 or 10% of my patients. So for the most part, it tends to be quote-unquote sporadic. So there's obviously a gene-environment interaction that underlies the basis of uh, Parkinson's disease. And this diagram, I don't know how much you can read of it. Uh, I uh, published in the Oxford uh, textbook of uh, Parkinson's disease, and it, it shows that Parkinson's is not just a one-factor model. It is multiple factors. It has to do with uh, causative genes, it has to do with genetic susceptibility factors, oxidative stress, neurotoxins, and, and trauma. And when all of these come together in a syner synergistic way in a given patient, you give rise to Parkinson's disease. Let's go down, uh, on to the clinical presentation. This is one of those classic Netter diagrams of Parkinson's disease uh, describing the typical uh, clinical features. When I teach students, I give them a mnemonic. I tell them about TRAP. T is for tremor, and typically this is a rest tremor. When the hand is at rest, you will see the tremor as opposed to postural tremor when the hands are outstretched, which is when uh, you consider a diagnosis of uh, essential tremor. Rigidity, uh, muscle stiffness. Sometimes we look for cogwheel rigidity where you turn the hand at the wrist and you see this clicking that you feel. It's basically rigidity superimposed on tremor that gives rise to cogwheel rigidity. Akinesia or bad akinesia, slowness of movement. This is the most important. So in my clinic, I will have patients do finger taps, and one side will be fine, and the other side will slow down. And uh, it's often an asymmetric onset, typically an asymmetric onset, so one side is more affected uh, first. And then as the disease progresses, changes in posture and gait uh, are also uh, coming to the fore. Having said that, more and more we're realizing that these trap symptoms are the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole host of symptoms below the waterline, everything from hyposmia, constipation, depression, sleep disorder, dementia. So there's a whole host of symptoms that we have to deal with, which is why I again come back to the topic of Parkinson's is not just a tremor disorder, it's a complex neuropsychiatric disease state. To understand why you have this whole range of symptoms, you've got to understand the pathology of Parkinson's which is the Lewy body. And if you look at this cell from the substantia nigra, you see this purple globule in the middle. It's an eosinophilic uh, cytoplasmic inclusion called the Lewy body. And incidentally, it has been found to contain alpha-synuclein, if you remember the PARC1 gene I told you about. Now, there's a staging system, a pathological staging system that was developed by Brock. And they have studied the Lewy bodies in, in literally thousands of patients' aut autopsy brains. And uh, they found that the progression of the Lewy body is very systematic. Uh, it starts with the deeper areas of the brain in the brain stem, spreads to the midbrain, and then further over the years hits the cortex. And what they find is that there's a prodrome to Parkinson's before the diagnosis of 15 to 20 years. Some of the symptoms that you will see include depression, anosmia, change in sense of smell, sleep behavior disorders, uh, REM behavior disorder, which can even be predictors of Parkinson's disease. And then you have the diagnosis and then the spread of the Lewy bodies to cortical areas of the brain, uh, which give rise to dementia, hallucinations, and the like. And the pathology correlates quite well with the symptoms that we see. So for example, the locus ceruleus involvement of the Lewy bodies leads to depression, the substantia nigra involvement is associated with the motor symptoms, and then the cortical Lewy bodies are associated with dementia. So this is uh, taken from a chapter I'd written on premotor symptoms, and this is a visual way of seeing how the pathological stages, stage one through stage six of Brock staging, correlate with uh, the clinical symptoms. So again, at the midpoint is that clinical diagnosis, 
but 15 to 20 years before, you will start to see one of the first symptoms, hyposmia, is often the earliest symptom. Uh, University of Pennsylvania has developed a test called as UPSET, University of Pennsylvania Smell Inventory Test, where you give people these smelling sticks and they sniff them and identify them, and based on the accuracy of the identification, you can uh, score them. And a poor score on that testing can be a predictor for Parkinson's disease. Constipation has been shown to be a premotor symptom of uh, Parkinson's disease as well. REM behavior disorder is being looked at a lot because it, it occurs uh, about seven to 10 years before Parkinson's uh, patients will have REM behavior disorder. So when uh, people without this uh, disorder sleep and they are dreaming, that's the REM state of sleep, there's a state of paralysis, it's called REM atonia. So even though you're dreaming of hitting somebody in the face, your arms are lying by your side, you're paralyzed, uh, but if you have a REM behavior disorder, uh, God forbid that there's a spouse next to you, she's going to get punched or he's going to get punched if you have a REM behavior disorder. So that can be a predictor of Parkinson's. Depression uh, is a very strong uh, comorbid factor of Parkinson's, but also a predictor for Parkinson's disease. And then you have the motor symptoms coming from substantia nigra involvement, and then over the years, these increase in severity but also Parkinson's becomes not just a motor disorder, but also a cognitive disorder with dementia coming into the picture. So in terms of the treatment, uh, you have to understand the chemical basis. And um, these rabbits, uh, I, I tell people these are the most famous and most important rabbits in medical history. And they were studied by a gentleman by the name of Arvid Carlson who studied at the NIH and went back to Sweden to form his lab at the Karolinska Institute, he was studying sympathomimetic amines. So for example, adrenaline is a sympathomimetic amine, dopamine is a sympathomimetic amine. And his experiment involved giving these rabbits recipine, which depletes sympathomimetic amines from the body, including the brain. And when he gave them recipine, what he found was these rabbits, as in the top part of the slide, these rabbits were slow, they were stiff, they were shaky, and he was smart enough to say, I've read descriptions of people with Parkinson's disease and they remind me of these rabbits. And then the next stage of his experiment was to inject a drug called as L-DOPA. And as soon as he gave these rabbits L-DOPA, within minutes they perked up and they looked like normal again. And again, he made the connection that maybe L-DOPA, which is a precursor to dopamine, is uh, a, a potential treatment option for treating Parkinson's disease. And for this work in 57, he got the Nobel Prize uh, in the year 2000 uh, that was uh, uh, awarded for his uh, research in this area. So if you look at substantia nigra, uh, the dark substance, why is it dark? Because there is melanin in the substantia nigra. And you might think, what has melanin to do with Parkinson's? And the reasoning is simple. Uh, if uh, you look at the metabolic pathways of dopamine, dopamine is metabolized to melanin. So if you look at normal brains, the midbrain area, the substantia nigra is dark pigmentation. But if you look at brains of people with Parkinson's on autopsy, there is a pallor in that area of the brain uh, that reflects a, a lack of dopamine. Now, is there a way of estimating this before autopsy? Is there a way of studying this uh, in, in patients? And until about two years ago, the answer was no for the most part, although there were some experimental techniques using PET scanning. But as of two years ago, the FDA has approved a technology. It's called DAT scan. DAT, D-A-T, stands for dopamine transporter. And it uses a compound called as ioflupane, which is very similar to cocaine. If you look at uh, cocaine addicts, uh, the reason why they get that cocaine high is because cocaine attaches to the dopamine transporter, and that gives the feeling of uh, uh, excitement. It's a reward molecule. So dopamine is studied by movement disorders uh, folks, but it's also studied by people who look at uh, addiction behaviors. So ioflupane structurally is similar to cocaine. But it's radio labeled with uh, iodine, and it's injected, and then it attaches to the dopamine transporter in the brain, and then it is imaged by SPECT techniques. So what we find is it is helpful in distinguishing Parkinson's disease from tremors from other causes, whether it is stroke-related tremor or essential tremor. It's a very good imaging study for distinguishing between these uh, uh, different uh, etiologies. As of yet, uh, the DAT scan techniques we have in the United States, they are not approved for distinguishing Parkinson's disease from atypical Parkinsonism, uh, 
Although in Europe, they've looked at quantitative techniques that can utilize this technology for that purpose as well. So this is what it looks like uh, on the imaging studies. You actually get a whole panel of these images, but I've chosen uh, two from uh, one of my patients, or two of my patients, rather. If you look at the Parkinsonian patients, you're seeing a lack of uptake. If you look at the essential tremor patients, you see a nice, dense uptake of the tracer. We say that in essential tremor patients, the images look like quotation marks. So you can see the quotation marks uh, in, in yellow in, on that DAT scan. If you look at the Parkinsonian patient, it, it looks more like a period. Uh, DAT scan technology, by the way, is not readily available, but in our area, we have it available at uh, Good Samaritan Hospital. I recently uh, sent a patient who had been running around searching for a diagnosis for about four years for DAT scan imaging, and she had severe uh, tremor in the right hand, also some tremor in the left hand. Uh, she had both a rest tremor and a postural tremor, so she had a mixed uh, tremor presentation. Could it be essential tremor? Could it be Parkinson's? We got the DAT scan. And what it shows was low uptake on the left side of her brain, and which is a very good fit for her right-sided symptoms because the brain, as you know, is, is cross-wired. So DAT scan, where there's diagnostic confusion, can be a, a test to consider in these patients. So dopamine is the chemical basis of uh, symptoms in Parkinson's disease. Uh, we talked about Carlson finding the stridonigral dopaminergic uh, deficit. The first person to use levodopa successfully was Kotzius, a New York neurologist in 1967. He was not the first to use it. Uh, levodopa was almost given up on because it causes tremendous nausea. Now, those of you who have uh, worked in the neuro ICU, they are aware that we use dopamine IV for uh, some patients. But why can't we use dopamine IV for Parkinson's patients? And the reason is there's a blood-brain barrier that prevents dopamine from entering the brain. So we have to use levodopa, which is a precursor, and that crosses the blood-brain barrier and enzymatically is converted into dopamine. So levodopa is used in that setting. However, before it reaches the brain, a lot of the levodopa can be converted into dopamine, and then it hits the peripheral receptors in the gut where it causes a lot of nausea. So these days, if you see, levodopa is never given by itself. It's always combined with carbidopa because that reduces the amount of levodopa that's required for the same clinical benefit. And when it first came out, carbidopa levodopa was called Cinemet. The brand name for carbidopa levodopa is Cinemet, and if you look at it, it's a clever term. Sin is without in Latin, and emet, emesis, so without vomiting, which was the big advantage of adding carbidopa to the levodopa. So levodopa, again, is a precursor of dopamine. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. Uh, its GI uptake requires a transport protein. Uh, and this uh, transporter in the gut is the same that picks up uh, amino acids from the diet. So you have to tell patients that the ideal time to take levodopa is an hour before or an hour after meal times, because if you take it together with food, the protein in the diet reduces absorption, and they may have a reduced uh, improvement, or they may even have a dose failure because of this uh, issue. If you look at uh, some of these uh, patients uh, before treatment and after treatment, and um, one of my mentors at Columbia University, Stan Fahn, he had a collection of these uh, patients from one of the first uh, clinical trials on levodopa, where before which there was no real treatment for Parkinson's, and he had these actual movies, uh, you know, nothing on the iPad or no uh, DVD or video. These are actual movies that he would put on a projector and they would break down every so often and he would have to stick them and make them run again. But these are patients with uh, untreated Parkinson's because there was no treatment. They're stooped over, they're drooling saliva, they're shaking like a leaf. And then he would show the next uh, film where they had been given levodopa and suddenly they look normal and they're walking across the room, there's a smile on their face. So it is almost miraculous what levodopa can do. It's almost a cure for Parkinson's. The difficulty with levodopa is not that it doesn't work. The difficulty is the half-life of levodopa. So if you look at the half-life of levodopa, it's only 50 minutes. And this gives rise to a number of issues. Uh, one is that in the early years, when your brain is still having a lot of dopamine-producing cells, you're basically filling in the gaps. And you can use levodopa twice a day, three times a day, and the patient's uh, symptoms are well uh, controlled. But as the cells continue to die, you have less and less dopamine-producing uh, cells in the brain. And then you have more and more gaps to fill in uh, with a short half-life drug. The second issue is because of the short half-life, the brain is exposed to what we call a pulsatile stimulation. So you give them a dose of medication, 
they get a pulse of dopamine and then nothing. You give them the next dose of medication, another pulse. And that changes receptor sensitivities in the brain and that can give rise to dyskinesias or involuntary movements. If you've ever seen Michael J. Fox on TV, he has that dyskinetic involuntary movement that can be more troubling than the tremor, for example. So a variety of preparations are available. I won't go into that uh, today. But if you look at dyskinesias, one of the things we have found is that the age of onset and the age at which you start levodopa treatment is important. If you have somebody in their 70s or 80s and you start them on levodopa, they're much less likely to get dyskinesias. If you have a young onset person in their 30s or 40s, like Michael J. Fox, they're much more likely to get dyskinesias. And part of it may be, it's studied in the basic science literature, it may be that dyskinesia is basically a form of abnormal learning in the brain. If you look at young brains, they have synaptic plasticity. They're able to form new memories, new learnings easily. If you look at old brains, they lose that synaptic plasticity, and so they cannot learn new uh, uh, ideas, but also new motor behaviors. So older brains are less susceptible to dyskinesias. Younger brains have more dyskinesias because of this LTP or long-term potentiation effect uh, that may play a role. So we've looked for alternatives for levodopa, and uh, one uh, alternative uh, group of drugs are called the dopamine agonists. So if you think of the dopamine receptor as a lock and the drug as a key, I would call levodopa the original key, and all of these other drugs are the duplicate keys. So they do open the lock, but they take a little more time doing it. They're not quite as effective. So pramipexol and ropinirol, Mirapex and Requip are the drugs in, in use currently. There were older drugs, bromocryptine and uh, pergolide, which we don't use anymore. One, because it's not quite as eff effective, and the other because it was associated with heart valve uh, problems, both of which uh, pergolide and bromocryptine are ergot alkaloids, which is what is associated with those kind of toxicities. But Mirapex and Requip are not ergot alkaloids, and so we don't uh, see these toxicities with those drugs. These drugs have a big advantage. They have a long half-life, six to eight hours, uh, which is why the incidence of dyskinesias is much less, 10 to 15 percent, uh, as opposed to about 45 to 50 percent uh, in uh, patients on levodopa at the five-year mark. They're also available as a skin patch. Nupro is a skin patch which gives rotigotine, which is a dopamine agonist, as a once-a-day preparation. So there are certain advantages to using dopamine agonists. Uh, however, Milton Friedman, he's a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist at the University of Chicago. He's famous for the quote, he said, there's no free lunch. And so there's no free lunch with dopamine agonists either. Even today, levodopa is still the most efficacious drug in terms of treating symptoms. Also, if you look at dopamine, uh, we think about dopamine receptors, but there's subtypes of dopamine receptors, D1 through D5. And D2 is where we want the effect. But D3 is the limbic system, and D3 is where uh, these agonists have a fairly, relatively high effect, which is why they can give rise to symptoms such as hallucinations, compulsive behaviors, including gambling, hypersexuality, aggression, sleep attacks, sudden drowsiness similar to narcolepsy is more associated with dopamine agonists, and daytime hypersomnolence is also more common. There's another group that we use, um, monamine oxidase inhibitors, eldopril or selegiline and azelect or resagiline are useful. I do tend to use these medications in newly diagnosed uh, patients. They can delay the need for levodopa. They can reduce oxidative stress in the brain. We were excited both with eldopril and with azelect uh, whether they might be neuroprotective, but I think in the absence of a biomarker for Parkinson's, it has been very difficult to really truly prove a neuroprotective effect for these drugs. So the good news for our patients with Parkinson's is we have a long list of choices. We have uh, the old-fashioned anticholinergics, which I still will use in some patients with tremor, amantadine, an old flu drug, which is used in early disease, but also can be used to control dyskinesias, the various levodopa preparations, dopamine agonists, monamine oxidase inhibitors. In patients with severe off-states and uh, dose failures, there's an injectable preparation of apomorphine that I've used. And upcoming treatments include uh, duodopa gel infusion, where you essentially have a peg tube inserted not into the stomach, but further down into the jejunum that, through a pump, delivers a dopamine gel to allow for a more steady state delivery. Intranasal levodopa preparations are coming up. Apomorphine pumps are coming up. So there's a lot of choices for our patients to, uh, to offer. Every so often, uh, the Green Journal Neurology publishes an algorithm for uh, 
Parkinson's disease, but I found these algorithms to be very use, uh, not, not of much use in terms of making clinical decisions. There's no single protocol. You really have to look at the patient in front of you and assess them. You have to look at their comorbidities. You've got to look at what other drugs they're on, what potential interactions they might be. And timing the drug with respect to age and uh, duration of disease makes a difference. So in general, there are two broad strategies in treating Parkinson's disease. The first says levodopa first. So you, levodopa is the most effect, uh, efficacious medication. Why not give it to patients on day one? And certainly in older patients or in patients with dementia, because you're avoiding the D3 effects, that is something to consider. But if you have somebody who is aged 40 or 50 or even a young 60, in general, longevity of life is not that much reduced by Parkinson's. So you're still looking at uh, trying to treat these patients over a course of 20 to 40 years. So there is a different approach called a levodopa sparing strategy, where you, in younger patients you might use monamine oxidase inhibitors as an early treatment and then go on to dopamine agonists and then bring on levodopa when you really need it. And in my practice, I found it can delay the need for levodopa by anywhere from 2 to 10 years, depending on the severity of the initial symptoms. So what I like to do is, rather than go with one strategy or the other, I try to look at the patient uh, and discuss things with them. You have to include the patient in their decision making. You have to make them a partner in their health care, and they really appreciate that. Now, what happens when medications don't work as well as they should? Uh, again, the good news for our patients is there are surgical options. Uh, the old-fashioned techniques I mentioned, uh, thalamotomy, pallidotomy. Deep brain stimulation, uh, today if we talk about surgical treatment, this is the mainstay. But also experimental approaches, GDNF, glial cell line derived neurotrophic factor, this is an area that I was involved with research. The idea is to use nerve growth factors that are uh, through a cannula delivered to the brain, and this allows reconnection and regrowth of the dopaminergic cells. Uh, GDNF was a very interesting compound. When we did imaging studies looking at these dopaminergic reconnections, we did find uh, improvement. But in terms of clinical efficacy, they were not quite as robust a response as we would expect even from DBS. So that still is work in progress. Gene therapy is very interesting. You want to increase dopamine in the brain. Why not deliver through a viral vector a gene that can upregulate dopamine production in the brain? And that is an area that is being looked at. And of course, stem cell techniques are being looked at uh, as well. I was uh, involved with uh, the recruiting patients for the, one of the earliest studies, the fetal stem cell study. But uh, what we found in that study was if you were older than 70, you did not have a response. If you were younger than uh, 70, you had too much of a response. So some of these patients had what are called as runaway dyskinesias, and they needed a pallidotomy to control these symptoms. This area of research is, again, coming back. There was a recent uh, report out of a group that is looking at new, uh, stem cell implantation called as Transneuro out of Europe. And they went back and studied some of these young patients. And they found that the quality of life in these patients, who now have uh, grown a lot older, is much, much better than would be anticipated based on the natural history of Parkinson's disease. Obviously, with stem cells, there are major ethical issues. But one workaround to that, which is coming up uh, through basic science, is what is called as induced pluripotent stem cells. So you can take basically a fibroblast and culture it in a very specific way so that it no more is a skin cell, but is a stem cell that can be implanted in the brain. And the obvious advantage is this avoids uh, some of the ethical issues we have when we deal with embryos or with fetuses. But again, the focus today is deep brain stimulation. This is what it looks like in the brain. There's a wire going into the brain. You can see it's marked out as the electrode in the brain. There's a tunneling done underneath the skin uh, to pass a connecting wire. And then there's a pacemaker-like device that sits underneath the, uh, the collarbone uh, that delivers the impulses to the brain. The lay press calls this a pacemaker for the brain. And I really like that terminology. If you have abnormal electrophysiology in the heart, you put in a pacemaker, the wire is going to the heart. Here there's abnormal electrophysiology in the brain, and the wire is going to the different areas of the brain that we are trying to control, and it can help control the symptoms. So on the surgical, uh, in the operating room, we place basically a stage around, it's called a CRW frame, and this gives us uh, 3D coordinates as to the different areas we're targeting, whether it's the thalamus or the globus pallidus or the substantia nigra. And then we put a probe in through different areas of the brain. And this is uh, where I come in with mapping the brain, because each area of the brain has a different signal, a different trace 
whether it's the thalamus or whether it's a substantia nigra, we have characteristic signal traces that we have learned to identify so we can improve the accuracy of the surgical targeting. Once implanted, this is what it looks like in the brain. This is an MRI section, and each side has an electrode in, 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 in place. And you can see that each electrode has these four contact points. And this is one of the big pluses of doing deep brain stimulation as opposed to doing thalamotomy or pallidotomy. Because with those older techniques, you basically are making a stroke in the brain. And you might be off by as little as two millimeters, but that can make the difference between controlling tremor versus giving somebody paralysis. Now with deep brain stimulation, you might still not be positioned perfectly, but let's say your lowest electrode is what your uh, lowest contact point is what you're testing. And instead of controlling tremor, the patient has his hand drop and his face is getting all twisted. You know you're not in the right spot. You have three other contact points that you can choose and you can manipulate and then find the best contact point for that patient. So it gives you a, a lot more room for error. The other advantage to deep brain stimulation, again, you're seeing on this um, MRI, this patient has had a DBS port on both sides of the brain. We used to do pallidotomies on one side and get, get great control of tremor, and the patient would say, you know, my right hand tremor is well controlled, why don't you do something for the left hand? And we would go and do the surgery for the other side as well. But we found that the brain is okay with lesioning on one side, but when you lesion both sides, they had severe dysarthria, drooling of saliva, memory issues, and the like. So bilateral thalamotomy or pallidotomy is very difficult to do, whereas uh, bilateral deep brain stimulation is uh, now, I would say, even become routine in advanced uh, cases with Parkinson's disease, and it is tolerated much better than lesioning techniques. It's important to set the expectations right with any surgical procedure. So of all the symptoms in that iceberg that I showed you, tremor is the one that responds the best. I also prefer to choose patients who have prominent tremor uh, for, as candidates for surgery because it's very easy for me when I'm uh, helping the neurosurgeon in the operating room to identify when I'm on target because these patients are awake during the procedure and after we are done mapping, we actually will stimulate the brain and they start out with a shake like this and then the shake stops and we know we are on target. If you're doing DBS for other indications uh, or other symptoms, such as, for example, gait and balance issues, it, you cannot really test them on the, uh, in the operating room. So it's a lot harder. We have to rely on other measures as, as uh, a way of judging whether we are on target or not. We do see a reduction in the off state and the severity uh, of the off state as well. So as I told you, patients, because of the pulse style stimulation, they have on states, off states. They fluctuate through the day between looking almost normal to having difficulty with uh, tremor and difficulty walking and the like. After DBS, they get a much more smooth response to the medication. If they're dyskinetic, the dyskinesias tend to improve. However, this is a surgery designed to treat motor symptoms, so the cognitive uh, symptoms do not improve. So we do like to do neuropsychological testing before the surgery. If patients have severe cognitive symptoms, they are not good candidates for DBS surgery. If they have severe axial symptoms, if they have lost postural ref reflexes and are falling back, even though they're on their best on state in terms of medications, they're not likely to improve. So I always make it clear to patients that DBS is not a cure for Parkinson's. It's not a replacement for medications. However, it is a good way to set the clock back on the disease. So if whatever state of disease you have, once you do the DBS procedure, you might have the state of disease you had five years before, or seven years before. And there is a good sustained response. I've had patients that we implanted in 2002 when I started at, in Chicago, and they were following up with me in uh, 2014. And uh, even though they're not as good, uh, say, at the 10-year mark as they are at the 5-year mark, and they're not as good at the 15-year mark as they are at the 10-year mark, it clearly is a robust and sustained improvement with deep brain stimulation. So if you look at the natural history of Parkinson's and you look at the gray uh, dots, there's kind of an early honeymoon phase where they respond reasonably well to the medications. There's a very slow decline. And then there's a second stage where the slope starts to steepen, and they start to have on-off fluctuations, dyskinesias, motor complications. And then the last few years, there's a very steep decline. If you look at what we really are trying to offer with deep brain stimulation, we're trying to change the slope of the curve. We are trying to keep that gradual decline, continue to be a gradual decline. So even with DBS, they will show some progression over the years but at a much slower state and hopefully avoid that steep uh, last stage of decline that we're seeing in patients who are uh, uh, untreated with deep brain stimulation.
Now, the final uh, area that I want to uh, discuss is the need for a team approach. I told you that the trap symptoms are a tip of the iceberg. There's a whole iceberg of symptoms we have to deal with. So it really behooves us to look at the patient in, in an objective way, uh, study them, uh, analyze their symptoms, measure their symptoms, and then choose a team that is going to address the symptoms. In my own practice, I use the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. This is not done by most neurologists uh, because it's a, a truly a research tool. It is one of the tools that was developed as uh, a research tool for uh, uh, clinical trials, including the stem cell study I mentioned. But I use it because it identifies all of the different uh, areas that I need to focus on. And based on what I see and I measure, I'm able to choose in advanced cases a neurosurgeon colleague in terms of deep brain stimulation. Neuropsychology might be involved. Physical therapy is a big, big part of treating these patients, especially when they start to show a fall risk. Pharmacy and dietary can play a role because of looking at drug interactions, drug-food interactions, and the like. And as we go into some of these newer therapies, we might incorporate other medical colleagues as well. For example, GI physicians uh, will be our colleagues in helping patients who may need a duodopa infusion. Cardiology is important because a lot of these patients have autonomic insufficiencies and the like. Urology because of uh, bladder frequency issues. Sleep medicine is uh, uh, because of the REM behavior issues. So again, a complex disease state needing a complex and, and a comprehensive approach. These are the American Academy of uh, Neurology Quality Guidelines. It's also a test of your vision. Uh, so I will summarize this for you, uh, the key points. There should be an annual review of the diagnosis. And why is this important? Because in the early stages of mimics of Parkinson's, for example, multiple systems atrophy, you can see a clinical presentation that is identical to Parkinson's disease, but over a year or two, the response to levodopa fades, the diagnosis is different, the prognosis is different. So an annual review of the diagnosis is important. Screening for motor complications. If you do the old-fashioned neurology visit, how are you, Mr. Jones? Oh, I have a little tremor. Fine, we'll see you in six months. We cannot really identify these motor complications. You have to screen them for this specifically, and which is where the UPDRS uh, helps me a lot in, in terms of assessing for these motor complications. Assessing non-motor symptoms. The so UPDRS includes that aspect as well. Assessment of fall risk. If you can prevent the first fall in Parkinson's disease, you're going to delay nursing home placement by at least two years in, in these patients. So preventing the first fall is extremely important. Using rehab measures when you identify patients who are at risk for fall, including physical therapy and occupational therapy as part of this is very important. And then annual assessment as a surgical candidate. Because there is a good time for surgery and a bad time for surgery. And you don't want to offer surgery too early because there's about a 2% risk of hemorrhage in the brain. But at the same time, we very often are sent patients who are essentially end-stage Parkinson's, bed-bound uh, with severe dementia, and they say, go see Dr. Dalvi. Maybe he'll help you with the surgical procedure. But it's too late to offer these patients surgery. So the conversation must begin early. Patients must know that there is a surgical option, be aware of it, and slowly, step by step, be introduced, be given information. In, in my own practice, I often will also allow with uh, the permission of previous patients who've had surgery to discuss how they came to the decision and how they are benefiting from the procedure. So it's a long conversation, a multi-year conversation before you offer deep brain stimulation surgery. And again, I come to the UPDRS as a guideline in terms of uh, making these decisions. Uh, it was developed by one of my mentors at Columbia University, Stan Fahn, and across uh, uh, the Atlantic Ocean at Queen Square Neurology, uh, 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 David Marsden uh, developed this for the fetal stem cell study as a variant of the original Columbia rating scale. It's a standard rating scale in research, and it has multiple components that really allow us to measure Parkinson's disease in any given patient or understand the patient in a comprehensive way and then design a treatment plan based on what we are measuring. So I've also developed uh, a program which involves a comprehensive approach to treatment of care. So our, our typical, uh, if you were to refer a patient to us, our initial visit would be our usual uh, one-hour visit where we would uh, uh, study patients, uh, understand their issues and the like. But in challenging patients and complex patients and patients where we're considering DBS surgery, for example, we will expose them to a two-hour follow-up visit where they will include 
uh, evaluation through a physical therapist, evaluation through a nutritionist, evaluation through a, a pharmacist, and then I will put all that information together and evaluate them in my uh, own visit and use the UPDR scale again as a guide in terms of designing a comprehensive treatment plan based on their needs. So in summary, our treatment approach, our treatment philosophy in terms of a comprehensive movement disorders program is going to include three different aspects. One is a quantitative approach to treatment. We want to measure the disease in all its aspects to identify what the needs are. We want a quality approach to management, which is going to, base, uh, which is going to be evidence-based, based on American Academy of Neurology guidelines. And it's going to be a holistic approach to care. So we won't rely on just one discipline or one physician. We are going to bring a team approach so that the patient's needs are completely and comprehensively met and will include even non-pharmacological -pharma or non-surgical measures, including exercise and, and diet as part of the total treatment uh, process. So to end uh, my presentation, I would like to show you, uh, uh, just to create an awareness of what some of these surgical techniques can do, a uh, patient who has uh, essential uh, tremor and is having a severe tremor, this person basically couldn't eat or uh, write for the last 20 years, and you can see why. So if he tried to drink a cup of coffee, he would spill it everywhere. If he tried to write his name, it was completely illegible. And we did a deep brain stimulation surgery on him on the left side of the brain initially. And you can see now the same person with the DBS device turned on. And you can see there's no tremor in that right hand, or very little tremor in that right hand. So there's a slight intention tremor, but this is somebody, uh, the day we, I turned the device on in the clinic, uh, this gentleman, we had to uh, you know, find Kleenex. We didn't have it in the office. He started crying because it was such an impactful uh, change for him in terms of quality of life. And you can see here his difficulty with eating and drinking. You know, it was just impossible for him, uh, an otherwise very healthy person, to need help even with eating. And here you can see how he does once the device is turned on. So tremendous positive impact uh, in, in his uh, clinical condition. So this is the sort of thing that we are trying to bring uh, over here and to uh, offer our patients. Uh, with that, I will end my presentation. But if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them.